Thanks, folks. Thanks for uh, showing up today. Uh, we have been, I have been taking this talk all around uh, New York State. There's a lot of computer professionals uh, concerned about this issue. Uh, some of what I'm going to show you today in our slideshow, uh, you can see some of the names up here, Barbara Simons, Teresa Hamill, David Dill. We've got computer professionals all over the country who have been sharing our resources and our concerns and uh, trying to get the word out and educate uh, the public about some of the potential problems with these voting machines. One thing to remember when we start talking about electronic voting machines or any voting is that uh, voting fraud has been with us since elections have been with us. That's nothing new. And those have been in power. Boss Tweet's a great example of a guy who really knew how to win an election. He knew that it doesn't matter how you record the votes. He knew that uh, it's how you count the votes. Who gets to count the votes that really counts? Remember, though, that's really important to keep in mind. Election fraud is nothing new. It's always been there and always will be there. What's happening, though, is we're now moving into a new world in the 21st century where we're starting to vote by computers. And we're juxtaposing a, a new problem because, um, as David Dill says here, everybody knows it's almost impossible to stop malicious people from messing around with computers. There are many vulnerabilities that computers have. Um, so a good reasonable question for us to ask and to take a good hard look is the computerized systems and the security mechanisms that we're proposing to vote with before we rush headlong into this. How did we get here? Well, you all recall the uh, Florida uh, fiasco in the year 2000. You know, we'll all remember those pictures of people looking at the chads and trying to determine um, how the, a vote was cast. Congress tried to fix that in 2002 and uh, what they did was they passed this Help America to Vote Act. We all call it HAVA and it requires all the states to min meet certain minimum standards in their election process. Not just computerized voting machines. That's only one element of HAVA. There are uh, important things in there about st statewide voter registration databases, uh, ID mechanisms, um, uh, access for the disabled. So HAVA has a lots of provisions related to reforming and changing the election process. Computerized voting is just one of them and we need to be aware of all of these issues but today we're going to talk about computerized voting. What's the problem? Well HAVA wants to prevent another Florida style meltdown that we had by replacing the paper and the mechanical systems with these new computerized systems. But computerized systems solve one problem, vote counting technology. And by rushing headlong into uh, recording our votes with these computerized voting machines, we're introducing a new problem involving vote recording technology. So in our attempt to solve the problem of vote counting, which was the Florida problem, we're introducing this new problem of vote recording. So let's take a look at uh, how we do that. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the kinds of computerized voting machines that there are. We refer to them uh, in the industry, not in the, the computer industry, um, uh, as direct recording electronic machines, DREs. We like our acronyms um, as computer professionals. And I have a few more for you before the day is out. Notice this is your second already. We've got HAVA, we've got DRE. There's another kind of machine I'm not going to talk about today. It's the optical scan machine. This is a machine that counts some sort of a physical ballot, usually a paper ballot, but can also count a CHAD type ballot. Uh, these machines are actually counting 80% of the vote in the United States already today. What I'll talk about is the touchscreen type machines, the DREs that record your vote electronically as well as count it. And there's two types of these machines and this is what you need to be aware of. The first type is a paperless machine where the votes are recorded, stored in computer memory or on some media, typically a memory card uh, just like you might put into your camera or your computer nowadays. And the results are stored in the computer all day long and only at the end of the day are the results tabulated. The totals are printed either there in the precinct or some of these machines actually send the votes out over a modem uh, um, uh, to a central server that counts them. The paperless type of machine is by and large what the vendors and what the companies that sell these machines are proposing that we vote with. And this paperless type machine is the kind of machine that where professionals and other activists in the area are most concerned with. And what we're saying is what we really need if we're going to vote with computer is a machine that has what we call a voter verifiable paper trail or voter verifiable paper ballot. And there's a difference with this type of machine. You still are voting with a touch screen, but you see a paper printout of your vote before you leave the voting booth. And we treat this paper ballot 
as a, just like we treat a traditional paper ballot that's there for us to uh, check the results against. DREs do have advantages and we should not forget about that and that's part of the reason that it seems inevitable that we will be voting with some type of computer uh, you know, within the next uh, five to ten years. A touchscreen interface, if it's well designed, should be pretty easy to use and pretty easy to understand. Although um, it is important for us uh, to remember that some of our, our older citizens, uh, and by that I don't mean my age, which is already pretty old, but, but there's a lot of folks that have not grown up with computers or not used computers among our older uh, population, and they're not, even a well-designed interface can be difficult for them. So let's think about that when we are uh, thinking about using touchscreen machines. Another advantage of DREs, though, is that very easy to make the multilingual, and one of HAVA's requirements is that um, uh, uh, voters be able to see the ballot in their native language. Um, as we all know, Spanish is becoming, rapidly becoming a, an important second language all over the country. And the third point, and this one cannot be underestimated, it's much provide much easier access and usability for the disabled community. Computers and touchscreen uh, machines can be fitted with different types of interfaces uh, to uh, enable disabled to use the machine. Those that don't have the use of their limbs, these machines can be fitted with what they call sip and puff interfaces where the uh, motions of the mouse and the clicks can be controlled by a little device that you put in your mouth and you control with your breath. Um, these machines can be fo uh, fitted with voice activated systems for the blind. Now, this is a very important issue with these machines because one of the things that HAVA provides and one of the things we owe our disabled community is, is accessibility, equal accessibility to voting machines. We all take that for granted and actually it may surprise you to know the disabled have never had that kind of accessibility uh, that those of us um, who are not disabled have. So this has become a very important issue and we need to find common ground because the disabled community is very much for touchscreen voting machines. Um, and they have their reasons, like I say, because accessibility is an important one. So let's not forget the advantages of, the, of these machines. Let's take a look at one uh, specific machine. This is the uh, Diebold AccuVote TS, it's called. Uh, it's been a little bit in the news lately, I'll tell you why. Notice it looks a lot like an ATM machine. It's got a touchscreen. This one you can see um, uh, the different races. There's six different races up here, each in a box. The a candidate that has been selected by the voter in this case is highlighted uh, with that little um, uh, dark orange square. And then down at the bottom you can see there's a previous, there's a next that allows you to move between different uh, races on the ballot. And off on the right there, the lower right, you'll notice there's a little, um, a little smart card access point. This is a, pretty much like an ATM where you put in your PIN card. With these machines, what will happen is you'll go into your uh, board of elections to vote, or I should say your voting, your polling place. Um, you'll sign in and they'll issue you a little magnetic card, just like your PIN card for your ATM. You'll go into the voting booth, you'll insert it there in that uh, little thing in the right, and that will initialize the machine. That smart card is also an interesting thing, I'm going to talk about that a little bit, but that's where that goes in. You place your votes. Uh, you confirm your votes with the machine and you walk out of the booth and your vote is stored here on this AccuVote machine. This particular machine, uh, although the vendors say uh, we, we don't run commercial operating systems, this one does. This one runs Microsoft Windows. Uh, and this particular machine also um, happens to be one of those that uh, doesn't tabulate its votes here on the machine but sends them out over a modem to a centralized server. Um, and that's another potential vulnerability uh, that some of these machines have. So this is the Diebold one, pretty typical for one. It looks a lot like an ATM, doesn't it? And that's the first thing that people often ask. Um, and it's a good question. And if you take away anything from the talk today, I'd like you to take away what we're going to talk about in the next two screens. Because people say that, well, geez, you know, I use an ATM for all my money transactions and all my financial transactions, and that's secure, right? Uh, so why can't I use my vote for, for that? If I can trust my money with it, why can't I trust my vote? So let's understand the reasons why a DRE is not like an ATM. They are, as a machine, very much like an ATM, as we saw. You put in a card, um, uh, you use a touch screen to interact with it, and things happen. But what happens with an ATM? Well, every time you do something with an ATM, 
there's a transaction number that's stored in a database that the bank has. Um, that's very important to realize. We don't think about it very much, but that transaction number is there and can be checked later by any bank employee, by you, um, uh, by others that might have official access to find out at that particular moment what happened, what happened with that transaction. It's recorded and it's stored in a database. Also, ATMs provide us with a paper receipt, typically. Nowadays, they often give you the choice to take the receipt or not. And finally, we tend not even to think about this because uh, ATMs are so ubiquitous and, and um, you know, kind of invisible to us in a lot of ways. ATMs have security cameras recording uh, the people as they use the machines. There are access devices. Some of them you can't get in unless you have a card. So there are security, physical security around ATM machines that we tend not to think about, but that is there. Uh, and these features are trying to prevent crimes. So that's all the different ways that when you interact with an ATM, that uh, interaction is being recorded and stored. There's a lot of them. What about when we vote? What happens when we vote? Why is an election different? Well, the main thing is that a fair election requires a secret ballot. If we started to implement the kind of security that we do with an ATM, we begin to violate the concept of a secret ballot. If I had a transaction number or a tracking number that was stored in a database like I do with your ATM, I could identify your vote by going back to that database. I could find out how you voted if I could access that database. If your ballot is not secret, if I have some way to find out how you voted, now we open up to a whole world of pop possibilities of problems with the election. Coercion and vote selling become possible. If I can find out how you voted, then I can coerce you to vote in a specific way if I have some sort of power over you. If I were your employer, for instance, I could say, unless you can prove to me you voted a certain way, I'll fire you. So that's a way I could coerce your vote if we had a transaction number. Also, like I say, vote selling. If you had a receipt that you took away with that, from that DRE with your vote on it, you could sell your vote. If I offered you $5 to say, if, hey, if you bring me your receipt tomorrow, show you voted for my candidate, I'll give you five bucks. Or it's a presidential election, I'll give you 10 bucks. You could come with that receipt. You could sell your vote to me. So it's with, we cannot have any uh, um, a paper records, any transactions of that vote. And that's why it's different from an ATM. Without the ability, because of the secret ballot, for us to record in any way what your vote is, other than that it was a vote for a specific candidate, but not from who, we're now relying on the software of a DRE to be perfect. That's essentially what we're saying, because we can have no other recording of it. I know as a computer software engineer that it's impossible to write software that is perfect and that we can guarantee is perfectly secure. And I'm going to go into a little more detail about that. So, but this is a really important point. Take away anything today, take away this, that the ballot voting with the computer, we cannot record anything about that other than what the vote was. And that's the key difference. Do problems happen in real elections? I'm going to intersperse these throughout the talk as we do this. Well, they're happening all the time, and this is a very recent one. just happened in January uh, in uh, Broward County down in Florida. They were using um, ESNS DREs. This is a special election. had only Republicans running, four Republicans running. There was a special election, only one race on the ballot, just this one race with four candidates. The DREs showed 134 undervotes. An undervote, like it says up there, is when um, uh, there's no vote recorded. So what these machines were saying was that 134 people went into the voting booth for this single race election and chose not to vote for anybody, turned around and walked out again. The machines didn't record votes for 134 people. Turns out the winner only won by 12 votes, which automatically requires a recount under Florida law. But guess what? These were paperless DREs. There was no record, re physical record of the vote, so it was impossible to verify whether the results of that um, tabulation were correct or not, uh, because there's no record of the individual votes anywhere. So this is the kind of problem that can happen with software. And this is one of the reasons we want to be a little cautious with, uh, with uh, um, uh, 
electronic voting machines. The, the vendors say, well, we can't verify this. If your vote was one of those 134 that were lost, how would you feel? I'm going to show you a little demonstration. This is a little piece of software written by uh, my friend Teresa Hummel down in New York. This is a little, uh, what we call our DRE voting machine demo. It'll give you an idea of a little bit how these, uh, how interacting with one of these machines work. This is a little, just a little bit of software that runs on a local laptop computer. This is not official software from any voting machine company or anything like that. I don't want you to mistake that. Um, but what we're going to do is I'm going to run a little mock election here. Um, we're going to just have uh, uh, three voters and there's one very crucial difference between a real election. Well, there's a couple of very crucial differences between a real election and this. But one of them is you're going to have sort of a God's eye view into how our three voters vote. Uh, of course, in our secret ballot, you would not be able to watch voters vote, but today you're going to watch our three voters vote. Um, and what will happen is when you come into this um, uh, uh, voting booth with a DRE, it's going to have some kind of screen that tells you, click here to start voting. Actually, you'll put in your smart card, as I talked about. Um, and uh, I'm voter number one. I'm going to come in here, and I will start voting. We've got uh, also a single race election for president. Uh, only two candidates, uh, John Doe and uh, Mary Smith. And uh, you'll notice there's two simple choices there, and there's another button that allows me to verify my ballot. Uh, I'm going to be voter number one, and I'd like you to keep a little tally in your head here. And uh, voter number one is a real fan of John Doe. I select that. Notice the button is selected, but nothing has happened yet. I'm getting some visual feedback that I've made this selection. I still have to go down here and say I'm ready to verify that this is how I voted. So I select that, and I come to a screen that says, okay, for president, your vote is John Doe. Is that correct or is that wrong? Do you want to start over? Uh, in this case, it was correct, as we saw. So I'm going to go up here, and as a voter, I'm going to say correct. I leave the booth. We just have our one race today. And now voter number two walks in and he also has the opportunity to start voting. Puts in his uh, smart card, clicks this, and the same choice here. Who does he want to vote for? John Doe or Mary Smith? Well, voter number two is a Mary Smith supporter. Again, notice that's highlighted, but nothing has happened yet until I go down here and say I'm going to verify my ballot. And again, here I come to the verification screen. It says, for president, your vote is Mary Smith. Is that right? And of course, we've been able to watch how people are voting. That is correct. Voter number three comes into the voting booth, puts in a smart card. Up comes the screen telling him to start voting here. And we click. And uh, voter number three is also a John Doe supporter. And that's the way he's going to vote. Let's take a look at what happens if I make a mistake. I'm a voter number two. I intend to vote for John Doe, but by mistake I select Mary Smith. Come here to the verification step, and it says, oh, for president, your vote is Mary Smith. So this is the opportunity for me to say, oh, no, that's not what I wanted to do. So I'm going to go over here to the wrong start over button. And notice that just takes me back to the screen again. It just allows me to go back. I haven't committed my vote yet. And now I'm going to make sure that I vote for John Doe, which is what I wanted to do. Come over here and I'm ready to verify my ballot. And here it is. Is that John Doe? Yep, that's who I wanted to vote for. I select that. And now we wait the rest of the day. We're projecting ahead to a time of such poor voter participation in the United States where only three people vote. And at the end of the day, after our three voters have voted, as a poll worker, I come in, I insert my special smart card that gives me administrative privileges. And with that special smart card, I'll see this poll worker may close the voting booth um, screen. And I go here, and essentially what this is going to do is it's going to have the DRE run the totals for me as the poll worker. And so it runs the totals, and here it is. DRE software tells me that John Doe got one vote and Mary Smith got two. That's the way it happened, right? No, that's not the way it happened. You know that's not the way it happened. Obviously, this little demonstration is, uh, is geared to shift the votes around for you. We'd like to demonstrate not just how you use the machine, how you interact with one of the machines, but how it's possible for software to very easily change the results of the vote regardless of what the user's input. 
Let's go to a special display that Teresa has uh, put for us here to take a look at uh, one of the things the um, software has done in this case. I've got three screens here and obviously you can see over here on the left that it says there's voter one voted for John Doe, voter two voted for Mary Smith, voter three voted for John Doe. We saw that happen. Of course in a real election we wouldn't be in the booth able to see how people voted to know that. What's happened is though the software has taken this list and has actually inverted the, the votes and what it displayed to the election worker at the end of the day was the results from that second list. And here it's telling us that voter one and three voted for Mary Smith and that voter two voted for John Doe. You and I happen to know that's not what happened. An election worker at the end of the day has no way to know that's not what happened if this is all the software is going to show them. And this software might do that for various reasons which I'll, I will talk about. In our case the software did it because we were malicious insiders. We uh, wrote the code to modify the results. I want you to take a quick look at the screen on the, uh, the list on the right. One of the things the vendors often tell us about why their machines are secure is because they say they keep a record of everything that the voter does, every step that the voter makes. Well, let's take a look at that record in our case here. It says, uh, here's the election start. It gives us the time that we started. And there's a voter sequence. First voter, it said, voter sequence one, selected Mary Smith for president, went and verified that it was Mary Smith, said it was correct that it was Mary Smith. Voter, uh, voter number two came in, did the same for John Doe. Voter number three, notice the sequence here. We have our um, wrong start over step here. Remember, we made the wrong choice. We went in. Um, but notice everything is reversed. So simply the fact that we're claiming that, hey, we're keeping a close transaction of everything the voter does in no way guarantees that the results we're showing you are what actually happened. It's just another list. As a software engineer, I know that in software we can do anything. Uh, and certainly it's very easy for us to show you a list happened one way even if it's not actually the way that it happened. Now let's get into a little bit of the details about why we're worried about these machines. Why should we not be trusting these machines like I've told you? In the first place, all the vendors who make DREs are claiming that their software is proprietary. That means it's got trade secret protection. They will not allow anybody to inspect the software. No independent software engineers, security experts can view the software or can test the software. The courts have even upheld the rights for them to keep this software a trade secret. So we have no outside independent agencies looking at the original source code to find out if it's flawed in, in any way. I'm not even talking about here a piece of software like obviously the one I just demonstrated for you was designed to switch the votes around. We're not even looking with that. We're talking about just inspecting it for security vulnerabilities. Um, so this is one of the problems that we have with it. The vendors claim this right to keep their software proprietary. What that means is they're the only ones that know about it. They can update the software at any time, just like Microsoft updates Windows for you automatically when you go online. Have you ever seen, uh, seen that happen? Vendors can do that with their software as well. So by not allowing anybody to look at the software, we'd never know what software is actually running on the DRE and what it's doing. In Wellington, Florida, here's what happened in 2002. In this runoff election, another case, one, one election, only two candidates on the ballot. Final tally, 1,263 to 1,259, four votes difference. And once again, we have a situation where 78 ballots had no recorded votes even though there was only one office on the ballot. And again, the claim was made 78 people didn't vote for anybody. It's impossible to verify because guess what? Nobody can look at the software to analyze what might have happened or what went wrong and there's no paper record. What's another reason not to trust these DREs? Well, bugs and hackers. First of all, I can tell you as a software engineer, I'll tell you the dirty little secret of software engineering. And that is that no program ever ships without bugs or defects as we call them. Uh, it not only ships with the bugs we don't know about, programs ship with bugs we do know about. It's impossible to write software that has no bugs in it unless it's very, very simple, very trivial software. Election software is not simple and trivial. So it's impossible to write a perfect piece of software. Secondly, it's impossible, almost impossible, to prevent tampering with the software by insiders. Uh, insider crime is always easier. Always. 
If I want to rob a million dollars from a bank, who has a better shot at it? Is it the guy that walks into the bank with a shotgun and a bag? Well, if he even gets out of the bank with his million dollars, he'll be caught within a day. But how about the smart accountant who works on the inside and shaves a half penny off of every transaction the bank makes for, for 10 years? Well, he's got a much better shot at getting that million dollars because insider crime is always harder to find out. Computerized insider crime is very, very difficult to find about. So we can't underestimate the possibility of tampering by insiders. And um, these vendors that um, write software for the, uh, for the um, DREs, they write some of their software, but some of the software is third-party components that they purchase. So that's another insider connection. How do we know that third-party software has not been maliciously uh, uh, messed around with? What's another reason? These machines have multiple access points. Remember that smart card I showed you? That's an access point. That uh, AccuVote TS machine we showed you, that, um, that machine sends its results out over a modem. It's connected to a modem. That's an access point. The vendors have people that come in and initialize the machines in the morning on election day, and they put a disk in or a memory card in. That's a potential access point. That's a potential place you can upload different software perhaps on the machine um, th to modify the vote. So there's lots of access points to these machines. The vendors would have you believe, oh, that nobody can ever get at them. They're under lock and key. There's lots of places to get into them. Who's motivated? Disgruntled employees, organized crime, foreign governments, hackers seeking prestige. Imagine that, I hacked the 2004 presidential election. Hey. You know, hackers love that kind of thing. And I don't know, politicians? Here's what happened in Comal County, Texas in 2002 with a DRE. Three winning candidates in a row got exactly 18,181 votes. Three in a row, 181, 181. Um, and they said, well, that's kind of weird, but nobody ever looked at it closely. We programmers know that every letter in a computer actually has a numeric representation. That's how the, the computer deals with a letter. Well, as you can see up here, the number for A is 1 and the number for 8 is H and you put 18,181 three times together uh, in a row, that's what you get. Ah, ha, 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 ha. Is that a hacker attack? Well, I don't know, uh, but it could be. That's exactly the kind of squirrely little thing you'd expect a hacker to do. So can I say that's a hacker attack for sure? No, we don't know. We can't know. It's proprietary software. This is late breaking news. Um, Maryland is about to go to vote in 2004 with DREs and there was a lot of um, a lot of unhappiness with that choice and the Maryland gover governor appointed a commission uh, and uh, uh, hired some people computer security experts to try to hack into the Diebold machines that they're going to use they're going to use those Diebold AccuVote TS machines the one I showed you a picture of in Maryland this independent set of researchers just released their report at the end of January, a couple of weeks ago, and what they found was what they called the gauntlet of problems. Among others, they found this security hole that allows remote dial-in. Remember I told you these machines send the results out on a modem? Well, it turns out hacker could dial in and gain administrative control of the machine. Um, uh, they also found it was vulnerable, what we call in the industry, a man-in-the-middle attack. The votes are sent out on this machine to a central server running the server database. A man-in-the-middle attack intercepts those votes in transit and changes their values before they get to the server. Uh, they found these machines were vulnerable to that. Uh, and then they also found that smart card reader. Remember I showed you the little smart card that you put in? Well, they found that somebody with uh, $750 of hardware and a little bit of knowledge about software could e easily program an off-the-shelf card to allow themselves to come in and vote numerous times. They found this and a lot of other errors. They said they were sort of surprised at the basic security level uh, of these machines. And that's one of the things we in the industry have found on the one occasion we were able to inspect the source code for one of these machines, also this same source code for the AccuVote TS, uh, was un inadvertently left out uh, on an open FTP site. Uh, and some 
people got it and uh, Johns Hopkins University put together a little team to analyze this. This was several months ago. This was back in September, I think, uh, or even earlier. They found all of these same problems that this red team, they call it, a team actually hired to explicitly try to hack the machines, found the same things in trying to hack the machine. So, uh, unfortunately, this uh, panel said, well, if they're not hacked, the machines count the votes correctly. And so Maryland right now is still going to go ahead. They've provided, they've said what they're going to do, and I love this, is uh, they're going to, to provide, remember I told you about multiple access points, the different places? The recommendation was for them to put security tape over all the, all the access points for these machines. So you're going to, people in Maryland are going to go in in 2004, are going to confront a voting machine wrapped up with duct tape, you know. Um, and uh, it, it's amazing to me that in light of what this report says, and I have, uh, I have the, the link in the actual report for anybody who's interested in it later, uh, given what they have found about the, the uh, vulnerability to hacking of these machines that Maryland is going ahead anyway. What's another reason not to test these? Inadequate testing. One of the things everybody assumes right off the bat is if we're going to be using computers for testing there must be some national agency that's testing these machines, right? Well guess what folks? There's not now and there has never been any mandatory standards for certification or testing of DREs. The testing that's done is done by so-called ITAs, independent testing authorities, that are simply companies, and most of them seem to have connections with the very same vendors that make these machines. So there's no independent testing authority out there. HAVA says, provides funding, uh, uh, HAVA says there should be one, but is not yet providing funding for it. So we have these machines out there that independent computer security experts are not allowed to view or test the software. And on top of all that, all the machines that we are currently using, that 20% that we're voting with already, there have been a lot of documented problems. And every one of these serious errors are on machines that have been tested. These have been certified. So, uh, so these problems that I'm telling you about are happening on certified machines. Certified means that some, some agency authority has looked at the machine, tested it, and validated that it is secure for elections. But the kind of testing that's done is really not security testing at all. It's basically functional testing. They take it in, they boot it up, they run a couple of votes, it counted, seemed to count them correctly. That's the kind of testing that they're doing. It sort of, it seems to work testing. Um, one of the things, and also in the industry that we know, is that uh, in, uh, designing a really comprehensive test suite is very difficult, if not impossible as well. And as a software engineer, I can tell you it's very easy to write code to uh, hide your rogue program uh, when it's being tested. It's very easy to identify in software when you're being tested. I could write the code to say, is it election day? Mm, my computer has a clock, right? Is it election day? Or if it's not, I'm probably being tested. I'll run the right results, you know? Th so there's all manner of things you can put in the soft code to try to work around uh, testing as well. Operating systems, we certainly know have security flaws. Some of these programs, uh, some of these machines use MS Windows. You've never heard about any security problems in MS Windows, have you? Again, a lack of strong national security standards. And the manufacturers are making basic secu computer security errors that we see. They have no apparent computer security expertise. And that's what this, uh, this red team found in Maryland as well. They were amazed at the basic level of security, like freshman computer science. What the vendors are doing are what we call in the industry security through obscurity. I'm going to keep my software safe by not letting you look at it, not letting you know what, how it works. I and any computer security person will tell you that security through obscurity is the weakest form of security. If you want to write software to be secure, you don't do it by hiding it, you do it by assuming that your attackers will know everything about your software there is to know. And you build the security into the software by writing it correctly, by using correct methods of encryption and authentication. But what the vendors say is, we're just not going to let you look at it. Therefore, our software is secure. Another thing, this is a good question for your local boards of elections. It's unfortunate they haven't uh, come today 
it's often the case we are finding uh, our elections commissioners really need more education on this topic. And one thing to ask them is, who's paying the hidden costs for all of this? HAVA provides money to buy the machines, right? Make that initial purchase of the machines. That AccuVo TS we saw, $7,000 a pop. Guess what, 20,000 machines in New York times $7,000, $140 million. That's exactly what we've uh, budgeted in New York State. But what happens after I purchase that machine? If you've ever put a computer system in an office or a business, you know that the ongoing costs are what really get you. The cost for upgrading the software, the cost for a maintenance contract, especially if you've got a complicated piece of software put in. Who's going to pay for that? Hava isn't saying. Are the states going to pay for it? Well, you know in budgetary times, if a crisis like we have now, the funding mandate keeps falling down to the most local level. Are our local boards of elections going to have to pony up the money for the maintenance contracts that they're going to need for this? Right now, nobody's even thinking about this, and I haven't talked to one election commissioner who's thought about this. If you do talk to them, this is a good point to bring up. I know you're getting the money for the machine. What are you going to do next year to upgrade the software and the year after that and the year after that? Who's paying for that? Nobody's answering the question. Let's kind of sum up about the problems. Software, if you do not have access to the source code, has to be considered what we call a black box. Something comes in, software does something magical. If you can't see the software, it's magical. And something comes out. What we do with, with, a, a, with computer system is we've got the screen touches coming in, we've got the proprietary software doing something magical, and we have the recorded votes coming out. And as we saw in our little demo, it's very easy to write a little piece of software where the votes for John Doe come in and a vote for Mary Smith comes out. As I've tried to show you, there's lots of reasons that could happen. Malicious reasons, yes, but it could also just be defects. So what we're saying is when we, when we run software on these machines, when we use DREs, any accidental or deliberate flaw in the software will compromise the election undetectably. We're basically saying for a paperless electronic voting machine we require that DRE software to be perfect. It can never lose your vote. It can never change a vote. I know folks and computer scientists know that's an impossible standard to achieve at this point in time. It cannot be done. So what we need to be asking ourselves is why should we trust these machines? Where is the burden of proof? And Proponents of these machines say, are, can you prove that elections are being stolen with DRE machines? Can you prove it? And the answer is no, I can't prove it. None of us can prove that. Uh, there's no convincing evidence or overwhelming evidence that a uh, an election has been stolen, but that's not the right question to be asking. The question we need to be asking is why do, should we trust the machines at all? We need to have proof that our elections have integrity because goodness knows Voter participation is bad enough as it is in this country. Folks don't believe their vote means anything as it is. If they start to lose faith in the machines that we, work, uh, that we vote with, we're going to see that even, even more and more of that. So what we need to do is assume that these technologies and these processes are guilty until proven innocent. We don't know that elections are not being stolen. And we have lots of cases, as I've showed you, and I have a few more to show you, uh, where we've seen that there have been problems and we don't know that votes are being counted. So this is what you've got to ask yourself. Why should I trust these machines? The vendors tell us that their hardware, it's secret. Their software, it's secret. Their cryptography, it's secret. And the independent testing authorities who have connections to the vendors tell us, guess what, folks? Our inspection procedures, they're secret. And our testing procedures, they're secret. We're basically just being asked to have blind faith that this is all working. This is the kind of machine that the industry would like us to be voting with. And we need to seriously think about if that's what we want to do. Now I'm going to talk to you about voter verified paper ballots. What can we do about it in terms of a technology? If a paperless DRE is as worrisome as I'm saying, what's the alternative? The alternative is what we call the voter verifiable audit trail or voter verifiable paper ballot. Why do we trust paper ballots? Well, there's a lot of integrity measures in a, in a well-run election that we have with paper ballots. We've been using paper ballots for hundreds of years. A permanent record is made of the vote, first of all. 
with a piece of paper, permanent physical record. There's a locked ballot box that's in view. We have processes and procedures for, view, for transporting these boxes, for opening the boxes and counting the votes with members of all concerned parties watching. So we, have, we, we understand the physical security of paper ballots. We know how to use them. We have process processes in place. With a VVPT machine, with a voter verified paper trail machine, the voter, that remember that verification step I showed you where we came to that screen that said, you voted for John Doe, is that correct? The verification step on a VVPT machine, or VVPB machine, that's the way we're calling it lately, uh, is different. There, that kind of machine prints a paper ballot that is displayed to you, the voter, and that typically will be displayed behind some kind of plastic screen or something. Remember, you can't take that with you, because if you could take that with you, you could sell your vote. So we can't let you take it with you. But that is displayed to you. And on it, it shows you how you voted in each race. Now, you verify, you read that, and you verify that, yep, indeed, that's how I voted on everything. Uh, you confirm it, and then that printed ballot is moved into a ballot box. Connected to, the com uh, connected to the computer. We treat that as the official record of the vote. And now we have what's essentially the same as a traditional paper ballot, a physical record of the vote that the voter, each voter has looked at and said, yup, that's how I voted. That's now being stored. Now we've got an alternative. We have a second opinion, as it were, physical record, other than what the software is telling us. In those cases where um, we had those undervotes. Remember, I showed you two cases where there was undervoting. If we had a paper ballot for each person that had been stored, we could simply go in and count the paper. And we would have our answer. Forget what the software said. Forget those 134 votes. We have the paper that the, the, voter, uh, the voter verified. So this is what we think is the best answer if we're going to computerize our voting. Um, if you're going to have a computer DRE to vote with, we've got to have some sort of physical paper ballot. And some of the bills I'll talk about shortly all have requirements for machines have, having some sort of voter verified paper ballot. They promise us the world. They say these problems are not security problems. As a matter of fact, uh, if you want to talk about chutzpah, um, that um, Diebold survey that I showed, uh, the red team attack on the Diebold in Maryland, Diebold official press release said it proves the security and integrity of their machines. It's like, huh? <laughs> it does? So, so their, their spin is that our machines are secure, we don't want open software, and by and large, they're starting to change, but by and large they say, we don't want voter verified paper ballot. What they say about voter verified machines is, it'll make them too expensive, is one argument they make. Uh, well, I tell you what, folks, I can go down to your local office supply store and I can buy a printer for 30 bucks that'll print out paper all day long as long as I keep paper in it uh, and ink. So uh, uh, the other thing they say is these, the printers will jam. We'll have all sorts of problems with the printers jamming. Well, guess what, folks? Diebold and these other manufacturers, you know, voting machines is only one kind of machine they make. You know what else they make? They make ATMs. They make uh, vending machines. And as a matter of fact, Almost every kind of other machine that they make does have a printer attached to it. So what's the problem with attaching them to our voting machines? Another uh, computer uh, 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 fellow I work with um, thinks that they may have just been caught making the wrong machine. They didn't think about this voter verified paper ballot. They made all these other machines and now that's what they want to sell. I've covered a lot of the problems already, so I'm not going to go into detail on a lot of these. I'm just going to flash through these real quick so we can see it. Um, but these problems have been happening and continue to happen, but not only with optical scan machines, but with the new DREs. Uh, here in Miami-Dade County, Florida, we had a problem with an optical scan machine and DREs um, counting ballots because a technician inadvertently moved the candidate on the list to the bottom of the list, but the software wasn't updated, so the votes were recorded the wrong way because the candidate's name was moved off. In this case, they actually were able to correct the results because an election supervisor and technician spotted the error and they found out about it. In Fulton County, Georgia, they misplaced 67 memory cards from the DREs. Uh, all of the ballots cast on those machines 
were left out of the vote. 67 cards. If that was one of your votes, would you feel good about that? 2000 Middlesex County, the Sequoia DRE was taken out of service after 65 votes. It, another case where it recorded no votes for the running mates, even though the candidates received 27 votes. So what Sequoia is claiming is that people came in, voted 27 votes for the candidates, but nobody voted for a running mate at all. It was a paperless DRE. It was impossible to verify. Johnson County, Texas in 2002. Onondaga County in 99, uh, vote counting. November 2002, Baldwin County, Alabama. Monroe County in 2002. Bergen County in 96 with an optical scan machine. Boca Raton in 2002. It goes on and on and on. I got pages and pages and pages of this kind of problem. So we've really got to keep in mind what Boris Tweed had to say, that elections are going to be tampered with if given the opportunity. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about current legislation designed to protect our vote against some of this. Um, right now, in the House of Representatives, the best one, um, the only one, is H.R. 2239. I'm sorry, the number is wrong on this. I apologize. It uh, should say 2239. It's the Voter Confidence and Increased Accessibility Act. This one requires a number of things. It was introduced by Rush Holt last year currently has 114 co-sponsors, um, Democrats and Republicans. We've been finally getting some uh, Republicans on board for this. It requires, among other things, that all voting systems produce voter verified paper ballot, like we talked about, so that we have something to do a manual audit and recount. It specifies that the paper ballot become the official record. And it bans the use of undisclosed software. Means you cannot have proprietary software. It means it must be made available for review by a citizen's commission. Uh, it also bans the use of wireless communication devices. Some of uh, these machines are on wireless networks. Uh, you think that's insecure. You know, you park yourself 100 yards down the road on a wireless network and hack in. So uh, HR 2239 bans wireless communications. Says it must be implemented by 2004 or with the waiver. It's basically a, a change to HAVA, so it, you can waiver to 2006. It requires uh, more accessibility uh, for f persons with disabilities a year earlier than HAVA does. So it actually moves that up. And it also calls for what we call this mandatory surprise recount. I've talked to you about voter verified paper ballots. If you never count the paper, it's no better than not having the paper at all. So if you're going to have a voter verified paper ballot machine, it's important to realize that you have to recount a certain number of the paper ballots. Uh, 2239 calls for in 0.5% of the districts a surprise random recount. Basically, somebody shows up at the polling booth and says, we're going to count the paper and compare it against the results of the software. So that gives you a certain number, amount of security. Also, you now have the paper whenever you need a recount, like in the case of Florida, where the law requires it because it was below a certain margin. Or um, and when a candidate disputes an election and wants a recount. In the Senate, um, uh, last year, Bob Graham introduced S1980. This is ba basically identical to 2239, word for word. Um, same thing, voter verified paper ballot bans use of undisclosed software. Paper ballots are the official record. So that's what we can do at the federal level. If we could get these bills passed, um, right now, H.R. 2239 isn't even up for a vote in the House. We've got to get it up for a vote. S1980 is not up for a vote. A um, lot of folks in government are saying, we don't think it's going to come up for a vote this year because it's an election year. We need to work. This is where we need to work at the federal level to get these two bills passed. One of the great successes, and you know, we're gonna, we, if you work on this with us folks, we're gonna see a lot of successes in this computerized voting. Uh, last two weeks ago, uh, uh, a study was done by uh, Barbara Simons and a few other folks. Barbara Simons has helped out with this presentation. They analyzed the internet voting software, SERVE, S-E-R-V-E it's called, found it riddled with holes and potential problems. Um, released a report on it, which made the New York Times. And surprise, surprise, I, I, I couldn't believe it, two days ago or three days ago, the Pentagon dropped it. The Pentagon has said, um, based on this, we can't guarantee it'll call the questions of the election and result, and we're not going to do it. So uh, an amazing success. The, the Pentagon will not be taking the 2004 military vote over the Internet. 
if you look at a, a typical accounting system, right, accounting systems have all manner of authentications built in. And um, now, again, remember, there is the, the special issue in elections about the secret ballot. But that doesn't mean that your software doesn't do basic security things like authenticate and, and, uh, and things like that. And yet, we're finding in the machines that we see in their operation that they're failing fundamentally at some basic computerized things. And it looks to me for all the world that the vendors saw this as a market, didn't put a lot of time and research into it, um, moved out and basically figured we're going, you know, we're, people will buy this. People, people don't understand this. Um, what has been amazing is the groundswell of, of people that have been speaking up and saying, hey, wait a minute, look at how these things are going wrong. Why, why isn't this as reliable as my accounting, accounting software? You know, what, what's wrong with that? What we're basically seeing is the privatization of our vote is what's happening here. Um, we shouldn't underestimate that. And, uh, and they're, they're not adhering to the basic security standards you would expect in any computer system. Computer professionals like myself, you think we don't think this stuff is secure. It's like, or don't even get started on internet voting. I tend to not worry too much about the vast conspiracy theories because I see enough wrong with the, the machines just as they are, you know, forget the conspiracy theory. Just recently, within the last couple of days, I saw a movement up on, um, maybe on blackboxvoting.com, somebody that's suggesting that programmers get together and write some open source software, just as programmers have gotten together and written the Apache web server software. Um, I think it's, you know, it's a, a bold effort. I'm not sure how viable that is to have voting software written by generic people out on the internet. Not that I don't think that's a viable way to develop software, I do. That's how Apache is developed. Uh, I just believe that's gonna be a hard sell to our official representatives for them to trust that. Except for the fact that this thing has a touch screen. This one isn't a whole lot different from the PC on your desk. Uh, uh, and they are exorbitantly expensive. Uh, it tends to be the nature of the industry when you have a um, specific solution, uh, a vertical, we call it in the industry, we call it a vertical solution. You know, when I write a word processor, that's horizontal. There's a lot of people that'll use it. This is a vertical solution, very specific solution. Vertical solutions tend to be far overpriced. Uh, and I think that's what the case is here. Um, I, I, I have a hard time understanding why that machine should cost $7,000. What can you do as a concerned citizen? Well, first of all, Inform yourself and your friends. You started that process by coming here. I'm sure you're reading. Talk to your friends about it. Educate them. Go down to the Board of Elections and talk with the commissioners. We need to get the word out about this. It's still under most people's radar. And like I said, many people still say, oh, voting with computers, that sounds convenient. Why not? Okay, so you gotta inform yourself. I've got a set of links, a page of links there. Um, there's a website, uh, lots of websites with information. But let me tell you, just learning about this is not enough. It's not enough, folks. This is very fundamental changes to our election process. We're defining our election process for the 21st century. What happens in the next couple of years is gonna be how citizens vote for a generation at least. So you need to get out and you need to work on this issue. I don't know if we can stop electronic voting at this point. So I think the answer is let's say, okay, let's vote electronically, but let's make that secure, let's make that reliable, let's make that source code that can be reviewed, and let's increase our confidence, and let's find a way. It's the 21st century, folks. Computers are here. Um, we're ju they're just not ready to vote with. <laughs> so, you know, let's, let's get them to the point where they're ready to vote with.